Today we'll talk about closing the gates on chronic pain. When you understand this, you'll know why you're focusing on the wrong things, thinking about joint alignment and pelvic tilt and weak core and disc herniations. These things don't matter most of the time. This is the thrilling conclusion of my pain neuroscience series. If you haven't watched the rest of the series, go watch that so you have the context to fully appreciate this video first. Because chronic pain is a nervous system dysfunction, and if you understand the neuroanatomy and neurochemistry, then this makes a lot more sense. Because chronic pain is not an anatomy problem. It's not the physical positioning of your joints or even the disc herniation in most cases. And even if this stuff matters a tiny bit, the neurochemistry matters way more. So it's not an anatomy problem, it's a physiology problem. Quick review. So if you step on a nail, you have nociceptors, which are damage receptors in your foot. Now in order to send a signal, they have to open a metaphorical gate, but if they do, they travel along a neuron, which we're gonna call a road. And if they get to the spinal cord, they have to go through another gate, which is a synapse. So we have a gate, a road, another gate, another neuron, we get to the brain, we have another gate, another neuron, there's a bunch of these. But in chronic pain, these gates are all wide open, there's no security guards at the gates, everybody's getting through, and so we have tons of pain because the signal is just getting pumped up to the brain even after the tissue has healed. So we get a lot of false danger messages. So today is where we talk about how to close the gates. Welcome, if you're new here, I'm Dr. Anthony Davis. I empower people with back pain and sciatica to reclaim the active life that they love. If you ever want one-on-one -on -one support, you can always watch the masterclass and then book a call to see if we can help you. Now let's talk about the gate control theory of pain. So if we have a nociceptor or a danger receptor that goes into the spinal cord, then it has to pass this gate in order to get on the next neuron that goes up to the brain in order to deliver the danger message. If we don't get past the gate, you don't have pain. But if we get way too many messages through the gate, you have chronic pain and excessive levels of pain. So in chronic pain, you have a nociceptor that synapses with a neuron that goes up to the brain, and this gate is, it's all busted open. It's, you know, everybody's getting through the gate. All the messages are going through. Um, these are false messages. They never should have gotten through in the first place. Security should have filtered them out, but your brain is getting bombarded with false uh, danger messages to the brain. And we need to turn that off. We need to figure out how to uh, close the gate and then fortify the gate, make it tougher and stronger so it's harder to send off a false message. So let's look at the neuroscience. We start with a nociceptor, which is a damage receptor that's going to the spinal cord. When we get there, we have to go through a gate and then get on the nerve that goes to the brain. Now at this gate, we have an inhibitory interneuron. Now these interneurons are like TSA agents or security guards that are going to pat you down, frisk you, make sure that uh, only certain messages go through the gate. So this little security guard here is responsible for opening or closing the gate. But the nociceptive fibers, when they enter the spinal cord, will not out your security guard, he's unconscious, so that everybody can get through, woo, we're going through the gates, we're going to the brain. So in come the heroes of our story, the A fibers. Now these are fibers from the body that are responsible for touch and proprioception and stretch and movement, all, all kinds of things. And they're gonna come in and they are going to wake up your security guard or replace him with a new security guard. Uh, in other words, metaphorically, we're going to close the gate. Additionally, from the brain, we have fibers that go down from the brain into the spinal cord. And likewise, they release uh, opiates, serotonin, endorphins, and kephalin. And earlier, I've used the metaphor of a fireman spraying water on the fire. Um, in either case, we are putting out the pain, either from the body or from the brain. And just to be clear, a fireman putting out a fire and a security guard closing a gate these are two metaphors that I'm using to describe basically the same neurochemical phenomenon. So how do we close the gate? Well, we can do it from the inside out using the brain as the instigator to put out the fires, close the gate, whatever. So we can start with the brain. So the brain depends on all kinds of sensation, you know, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, as well as memories and context and expectations. And these are going to inform your beliefs and your ideas and your state of mind and ultimately determine whether or not you believe you are in a alarm state, a dangerous uh, state, whether there is something that deserves you hitting the alarm or not. Ultimately, if the brain believes you are in an alarm state, then the gate is going to open and you are going to have pain. But 
if we can convince the brain that things are safe, either based on sensations, right? We're scanning the environment for threats and we think, no, I think I'm safe, but also informed by your beliefs, expectations, memory, et cetera. And again, that beliefs and expectations and mindset around your pain is really important here. Then if you believe, hey, I am in a safe state, then the gate is going to close and you are not going to have pain. The other way that we can close the gates is from the outside in, from the body, from the outside of the body to the spinal cord. So we're coming from the outside using the body, that could be movement, touch, etc., to actually make physical changes inside the spinal cord. So again, back to our picture here, we've got the A fibers that come from the body and then we've got the uh, fibers that come from the brain and all of these are going to you know, close the gate. So right now we're talking about the A fibers from the body, these are responsible for touch, massage, vibration, proprioception, movement, etc. And earlier, you know, again, I've, I've used the metaphor of a fireman trying to put out a fire. So how do we put out the fires? How do we close the gates? Well, we've got basically two options from the outside in. One is touch, physical touch, hands-on treatment uh, that you could either get from somebody else or you could do it yourself or movement. When it comes to hands-on treatment and touch, of course, you could go to somebody, you could get a massage, acupuncture, chiropractic adjustment, whatever. It's all basically the same stuff. There's nothing magic. They're not breaking up adhesions, putting your joints back into place, releasing scar tissue, uh, fixing your posture, fixing your imbalances. None of that is real. None of that is evidence-based, but all forms of touch work because they are a temporary pain reliever. They temporarily close the pain gate. So any kinds of hands-on treatment, or you could do it yourself, do self-massage, you could use heat or ice, uh, you could use topical analgesic like uh, capsaicin or menthol or some other things, um, or you could use vibration, a massage gun, even inversion tables, whatever. Any of this stuff is going to impact pain by closing the gates. And then of course we have movement and exercise. Now, if you can't do any exercise, you can actually visualize exercise because there's a lot of weird research that shows that your brain kind of can't tell the difference between actually moving your body and thinking about moving your body. So even if you think that every exercise is too painful, you could visualize yourself doing something that you believe is dangerous and turn off the alarm signals by pretending that it feels safe in your head. And then meanwhile, do simple exercises like stretching and then eventually work your way towards doing real cardio, get some blood flow, some endorphins and strength, make your tissues resilient. And in the whole process, we wanna make sure that we're getting good joint movement through the areas that are sensitive because like, let's say that I hurt my wrist, then I wouldn't just exercise like my arm. I would also do specific joint movements here. Not that any of these are magic or they're gonna fix my alignment or something, but because I'm stimulating the joint proprioceptors or movement or position sensors that tell my brain where my wrist is in space. And then if my brain has a better perception of my wrist, and it has stimulation from the wrist that says, hey, the wrist feels good. Hey, the wrist feels good. Uh, hey, the back feels good because we're doing cat cows, pelvic tilts, um, you know, uh, bird dogs, whatever. Like it's the simple stuff at first, hip mobility, whatever. Those types of things are a good gateway towards full body strength and resilience and cardiovascular exercise. So let me just pause. Does this make sense? Um, are you having any, you know, like aha moments? Are you seeing how this clicks? I know this is kind of like broad view here, but that's the truth is that all of this stuff, you do have a lot of options, right? And so if you really like getting a massage, great. You can get massaged. You have to understand it's temporary and that we need long-term movement and resilience, but we still have a lot of options. So um, if you have questions, obviously put them in the comments. If you're having light bulb moments, put it in the comments. Let me know what's going on. Now, the cool thing is these gates are everywhere, right? We're all so obsessed with pain being in a specific tissue, but pain literally does not exist in a tissue because pain doesn't happen until it becomes a conscious experience. So we can't say that pain exists in a disc or in a sacroiliac joint or in a muscle, right? Uh, the cool thing is that we have these gates all over the place. We have the gates in the muscle, along the way to the uh, in the spinal cord, in the brain. We've got gates all over the place, which means we have a lot of opportunities to close the gates. So what are the best treatments? Well, we already talked about touch, any kind of hands-on treatment. These are good temporary pain relievers. But of course, they're just temporary. Now that doesn't mean they're bad. In fact, even though they are temporary, if we continue to reinforce a positive association with a particular area in the body, your low back, for example, um, then your brain starts to associate positive things with that area. And we have the same types of neuroplastic changes that we saw 
from repeated pain, 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 sensitivity, pain, pain, pain. And then the body basically gets more efficient at feeling pain. Well, if we just do the opposite and we repeatedly bombard the brain and body with good feeling things, then your body gets better at feeling good things, essentially. It gets better and more efficient at feeling good. So hands-on treatment and all that kind of stuff is not bad, and you can continue to do it as part of treatment, but we also need exercise, right? We need to get good cardio and strength and mobility. Those are the main three things that matter the most. And the reason is it has a lot of different changes. Obviously the neuroplastic changes that I just mentioned, but then the actual structures, your bones, joints, ligaments, tendons, muscles, nerves, discs, everything gets tougher and and harder to injure. Uh, On top of that, exercise is anti-inflammatory long-term, right? It builds self-efficacy and self-reliance and confidence and safety, a feeling of safety. And we have expectation violation where previously we say, oh, I'm expecting to have pain when I exercise. I expect that pain is uh, inevitable, that exercise is dangerous. But if we can violate that expectation, for example, if you think that bending is dangerous and I come up with a simpler way to bend the spine that's gentler, and your brain says, oh, weird, I thought that was going to hurt, but it actually kind of felt okay, or maybe even felt a little bit good, then it can turn off the alarm system and again, rewire the brain and the rest of the nervous system to make neuroplastic changes to become more efficient at feeling and expecting to feel good and then actually feeling good. Beyond that, Your mindset matters. We've already talked in this series a lot about the neurochemistry and physical anatomy of how stress and fear literally create pain through actual tangible neurochemical connections. It's not in your head. So something to calm your nervous system is absolutely essential in the process. And if you think, well, I don't have any stress, being in chronic pain in and of itself, even if everything else in your life is perfect, which I guarantee it's not, but even if it was, then just being in chronic pain puts your body in an alarm state, right? That just the pain itself is viewed as a threat. So we need to somehow calm the body and mind and nervous system down and feel safe. Now, I like meditation and breathing exercises, but maybe you like creative activities. Um, Pain science education helps. Uh, maybe you like um, prayer or social endeavors, or you know, joining a book club or reading a good book. I, I don't. I don't care specifically. I just care that you have something that genuinely calms your nervous system and makes you feel safe. Next up is cognitive behavioral therapy because sometimes, you know, all the self-help in the world and breathing exercises, you know, sometimes people have some real stuff going on. You know, you're dealing with trauma or grief or loss of a loved one or some major stuff in your life, you know, big life changes and having cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I could cite a ton of studies on this, but you know, CBT is has shown to be a effective as part of treatment for chronic pain. Um, So if you've got a lot of stuff going on in your life um, and some major things that you're healing and recovering from or processing, um, having some real CBT is important and genuinely improves pain. Beyond that, pain neuroscience education. Uh, Sorry, my citation here isn't showing up, um, but pain neuroscience education, right now you're doing treatment. Right now you're doing treatment, right? Because you're learning about pain and understanding how pain actually works and the neuroscience of it, that alone turns off some of the alarm bells, right? And the heightened state of the nervous system and reduces that neurochemical inflammation that results from that chronic stress and fear state. So we need the knowledge, but then we need to back it up with all the other things that I already mentioned. So today we talked about closing the pain gates. I told you about the gate control theory of pain and how we can either open or close the gates. We talked about the neuroscience of how the nerves interact, how we rely on these little interneurons, which are like security guards that open or close the gates. We discussed how from the inside out, we can use the brain and our senses, um, as well as our expectations and beliefs and memories and context to inform whether or not we're going to put the fires out and close the gates. Then we talked about going from the outside in and using hands-on sensations and touch and vibration or um, massage, those types 
of things, but also backing it up with movement and exercise to make the body tough and strong and resilient. You learn that gates are all over the place. So you have tons of opportunities from the top down, bottom up, inside out, outside in, to be able to reduce pain. And we talked about the best treatments, which are something hands-on for pain relief, something for movement to make your body strong and resilient, something for your mindset and mental health to calm the alarm state of the body, and then of course, education, which you're already doing right now, so that you understand things and you don't feel that you are in a threatening state. You feel like we are safe, secure, and we are capable of healing. So quick question, like, can you see that when we understand the neuroscience, especially throughout this whole th series, can you understand why, you know, I, I sort of dismiss, you know, the foam rolling, the medications, the posture correction, the core stability, the muscle imbalances, the acupuncture, um, obviously injection, surgery, medications, all that kind of stuff. Uh, in most cases, not all, but in most, these things just seem really silly because like even if you have the surgery and some people legitimately need surgery and I'm not opposed to it, I point people, I tell people to get surgery in many cases, right? Because sometimes you need it. But even if you did need surgery, let's take the extreme example here. Even if you did need surgery, and some people do, we still got to come back to it and understand why did that happen in the first place? Why did the pain happen in the first place? Why was your disc fragile enough that it herniated in the first place? And then why did your nerves become extra sensitive as a result of that? And again, there's no escaping the fact that if you want to live a healthy life, we can't foam roll it away. We can't posture fix it away. We can't brace your core and fix your healthy, you know, your unhealthy lifestyle, right? None of this stuff is going to fix exercise, nutrition, mental health, and sleep. That's, if you want to live a healthy lifestyle, it's inescapable. You have to do those four things. So if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't already seen the masterclass and you want to take a deeper dive um, and learn how to conquer chronic back pain and sciatica without drugs, surgery, or complicated exercises. And if you're interested in getting a little bit more help and booking a call to see if we can help, watch the masterclass. I will see you in the next video.